So last time we had uh, discussed, uh, okay, so here it is. So we're going to talk about adjuvant therapy in uh, pancreatic cancer today, includes periampillary cancers as well. So uh, we briefly talked about uh, BRCA, that pancreas cancer is one of the BRCA associated cancers and um, all the guidelines now recommend that patients with the pancreatic cancer should undergo germline uh, mutation testing. And uh, so you have the risks here, about 5% uh, patients are likely to be BRCA2. Biliary tract cancer also, I think there are a few papers which show that uh, they may be BRCA2 positive, but it has not made its way into the guidelines uh, yet, uh, but possibly uh, may do. Very important that you differentiate germline versus uh, somatic, uh, uh, somatic uh, 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 mutations. Even if you, and we are doing NGS testing in, in most of our patients nowadays when they progress. So if you do see a germ a somatic mutation with BRCA2, PALB2 or ATM1, it's important that the patient undergoes germline testing as well. Screening is mainly, uh, mainly we talk about screening for cancers which lend themselves to a precancerous stage and high risk uh, IPMNs or uh, uh, pancreatic intraepithelial neoplasia lends pancreas cancer also eligible for this. And now there are a few papers where they talk about for patients with BRCA cancers, if you are doing an MRI of the breast, then the MRI of the pancreas also should be uh, included. And most of the, of the guidelines also suggest screening for pancreas cancer about a decade before the, the, the index patient in the family has been diagnosed. So I think it's very important for you to know about because it's important we diagnose this cancer early especially in high-risk patients. The other cancers which lend themselves to screening because there is a precancerous component attached to it are colon cancer, cervical cancer, and, uh, and breast cancer. So, um, so again, genetic counseling is very important before you order a, a, a BRCA test. And... Um, Positive mutation is associated with increased risk of uh, cancer progression and uh, is also very important for the family. The modalities recommended are MRI uh, in combin uh, or uh, EUS, and the screening is to be done every 12 months. So this is just briefly, I wanted to talk about this. Pancreatic cancer, three epithelial types, exocrine, ductal, and endocrine. You will also hear about acina cell carcinoma. Again, um, uh, ductal and acinar very likely treated uh, separately. Acinar is very rare. Usually they have a longer survival and uh, CA199 is not usually raised. Uh, they usually present with very large tumors. The last patient I had was uh, had a, a 10 centimeter pancreatic mass and the AFP was uh, raised, which is slightly unusual in a patient with pancreas cancer. Neuroendocrine we've already discussed in the first session, so we will not talk about so the adjuvant therapy we discuss will be in ductal adenocarcinoma of pancreas. So gemcitabine has been the standard of care. We talked about that when it was compared in advanced cancers with 5-FU, the median survival was significantly better and 12-month survival was 18, one-year survival was 18% versus 12% when gemcitabine was compared with the 5-FU. We'll talk about how uh, the adjuvant treatment has evolved and what the current standard of care is today. So SPAC-1 was the first study. I'll just go through the SPAC story, which is very interesting, uh, led by Professor John Neoptolmos in, in, in UK. And I was part of recruiting into a few of the SPAC studies as well uh, at the Marsden with Professor Cunningham. So SPAC-1 is a two-by-two two factorial design, looked at observation versus chemoradiotherapy and bolus 5-FU versus chemo-RT and chemotherapy. And basically the results were that uh, chemotherapy does add benefit in prolonging survival for patients with pancreatic cancer. The study included T1 patients as well. In this study, there was a deleterious effect from uh, addition of chemo radiotherapy. 
So if you see here, the survival rates, the two-year survival with the no chemotherapy versus chemotherapy was 30 versus 40%, almost 10% higher. And the, and the five-year survival was three times higher with, with very good hazard ratios. And you can see the curve start separating at, uh, at one year. The CONCO one looked at the question of uh, gemcitabine versus uh, observation. So now we know that, um, that addition of chemotherapy versus observation is better. CONCO looked at the question of gem versus observation, and this study showed that there was a significant overall survival advantage of 23 versus 20 months, three months advantage over observation with gemcitabine. So this study was the pivotal study actually, which established the six month as the standard of care or the course of gem gemcitabine for uh, patients with uh, uh, pancreatic cancer. It did not look into uh, radiotherapy. So we've accepted gemcitabine as standard of care. The long-term results of CONCO 001 uh, uh, published in 2013, 10 year survival was 8% versus 12%. Uh, so remember this figure, median overall survival of uh, 12, 23 months. Uh, when do you work? So uh, sorry about that. Um, so the next study is uh, looking at uh, the RTOG study. I think these studies are very important. Uh, all of these, if you, and uh, they're, uh, they, uh, they have actually uh, got us to where we are today in improving the outcome for our patients with pancreatic cancer. So both the arms in the RTOG study got 5-FU radiotherapy, but in one of the arms, they had a continuous infusion of 5-FU, and in the other arm, the patients received gemcitabine pre and post. And this study included pancreatic head tumors only, showed slight benefit of gemcitabine over 5-FU in pancreatic head tumors. So if you look at the three years survival was 31% versus 22%. And the median survival was 17 versus 20 months, more so in favor of uh, gemcitabine, but it was not statistically significant. More uh, grade four hematological toxicity was seen with the gemcitabine. I think for our uh, non-medical oncology colleagues, uh, gemcitabine causes more myelosuppression while 5-FU causes more of diarrhea. And, uh, and mucositis-like uh, symptoms did not resolve the question of radiotherapy because both the arms received radiotherapy. Just to make a point about SPAC-1, which we discussed, uh, which had, in which the radiotherapy had a deleterious effect, I must say that, that the, the, the type of radiotherapy that was used was quite old, was not as accurate as what we use uh, today. So we cannot uh, actually extrapolate it, the results to today. So looking at the SPAC-3, uh, SPAC-3 was also one of the studies uh, which included patients with periampillary uh, adenocarcinoma. And in India, we tend to see more of periampillary patients uh, compared to, to the West. So this randomized patients to gemcitabine versus 5-FU, again, more than 1,000 patients. You've seen in the earlier trials, the number of patients were between 250 and 300. So uh, here we wanted to know whether the metastatic story translates into the adjuvant story as well. And we've learned from colon cancer that what you see in metastatic setting does not necessarily mean that you will see it in early setting as well. A lot of targeted drugs, adenotecan, work very well in uh, metastatic colon cancer, but they do not work in uh, early colon cancer as adjuvant treatment. So that was a reason to do this study because we know in metastatic setting, gemcitabine is the standard of care. So as you can see, uh, there was no difference between uh, gemcitabine or 5-FU folinic acid. The progression-free survival and the overall survival were pretty much uh, for both the studies. The two-year survival was also 48-49%, very similar. But what was seen was that the toxicity was, was lesser with the gemcitabine, and that's why gemcitabine was taken as the standard arm and taken forward for the SPAC-4 uh, trial design. SPAC-3 did not show superiority of gemcitabine over 5-FU. The, uh, the periampillary study had about, uh, I think, more than 100 patients. 
uh, which also showed that uh, uh, that there was no superiority of one drug over the other, but also showed that uh, uh, with 5-FU gemcitabine versus observation, so patients who were on observation arm also did, uh, did as well, did not show benefit of chemotherapy in the periampillary uh, setting. SPAC4 uh, took gemcitabine as forward and uh, given one grams per meter square four weekly for six months. So six months is a standard of care in most of our adjuvant studies, except in colon now, where we are talking of three months. So we haven't started de-escalating in, in pancreas yet uh, because the survival and the outcomes remain quite uh, dismal. Patients were randomized, again, more than 1,000 patients to gem versus gemcitabine, capecitabine. Again, the doses of capecitabine are quite high and very rarely do I see an Indian patient uh, who would tolerate this high dose for 21 days of a four week cycle. Most of our patients, I would say, would tolerate 1,250 milligrams per meter square uh, given twice a day. So uh, primary endpoint was overall survival. The median age was reflective of the previous studies uh, as well. Uh, what is interesting is that the surgery to randomization uh, was nine weeks almost. So I think it's very important before patients start adjunct treatment that they've recovered from, uh, from the ripple surgery, which is one of the most complex surgeries uh, that we see in GI, uh, GI cancers. Um, the toxicity, again, I won't go into the details here, uh, was understandably more in patients who were on the gemcitabine, capecitabine, except infections where gemcitabine, in the gemcitabine arm, there were slightly more in, um, in, the, in, in, in this study. But again, overall, very, very uh, comparable. So uh, gemcitabine, capecitabine, the doublet arm did significantly better 25, 26 months versus 22, uh, 28 months with a hazard ratio of about uh, 20%. So significantly better overall survival with gemcitabine, capecitabine. And uh, the study showed that well-differentiated patients did better. Patients with node negative did better and those who had an R0 resection did better. So nothing new here. So if we look at all the SPAC studies, the five-year survival with SPAC1 with the best arm was 21% with 5-FU. And if you look at SPAC4, the gemcitabine, capecitabine, it's almost 29 months. So remember this figure of 29 months uh, uh, with SPAC4, uh, the five-year survival. Uh, significantly, so all of these studies have shown that one arm has done significantly better than the other, except the SPAC3 trial, which was pretty similar, gemcitabine just about a, a month longer. The forest plot for of all the trials that have been published with GEMCAP versus GEM uh, show that uh, there is a, a significant benefit of doublet gemcitabine, capecitabine. So GEMCAP actually includes both fluoropyrimidine and gemcitabine. If you look at the snapshot, you will see that all the so the curve drops very sharply within the first year. So most of the recurrences that do happen, do ha happen in the first year uh, itself. And the median survival overall, if you look at the SPAC4 study uh, with the gemcitabine arm is 28 months versus 22 months. Uh, look at the CONCO, the earlier trial. So there has been progress with the SPAC and the CONCO studies uh, from 21 to 28 months. All of these trials listed here with the references at the bottom, again, are very important studies which have shown us the progress in pancreatic uh, cancer. So this has shown that uh, adjuvant therapy works, but uh, if you read the small print in most of the trials, you will see we discussed this last time as well uh, when we discussed the new adjuvant strategy that only 50% of our patients actually get to, new, uh, to adjuvant therapy half of our patients do not get to systemic treatment. So we know adjuvant treatment works. None of these patients had had new adjuvant uh, therapy. So basically it means that systemic treatment works. 25 to 30% of patients die in the first year. So gemcitabine and optimal administration of 5-FU do quite similarly, but if you combine them, they do even, uh, even better. 
coming on to the studies which uh, which are impacting care uh, today for our patients uh, i attended asco 2 years ago in 2018 uh, and after we came back we had our mdt i remember that uh, in the next mdt we changed practice uh, we did not even this was one paper we did not even wait for the fine print to come in because the results were so staggering and uh, so practice changing and i feel cost effective because uh, having a, I, mean, i know the cost of fulfurinox with generics is not more than 10000 or 10 to 15000 or even less in places like tata hospital or or regional cancer centers so this is not something which is very expensive uh, and for 6 months it is it is doable so this study uh, randomized patients to a uh, modified fulfurinox for 6 months versus gemcitabine for 6 uh, months it would have been nice to have a gemcitabine capecitabine as the standard arm here so patients uh, patients were included uh, who had a ca99 level of less than 180 i think all the guidelines do recommend and i tend to do it as well we do a baseline ca99 and i always do it before i start adjuvant chemotherapy very often you will see that you know you see a patient after surgery and the ca99 has dropped but very often you will see uh, about 10% patients i would say in my practice where the ca19 has jumped up to you know 1000 or something you do a pet scan or a ct scan you will find uh, some form of metastatic disease so it's very important post op you do a ca99 it's not very difficult especially if it is it was raised before without jaundice uh that initiate a scan before you start adjuvant treatment because the intent of treatment for that patient is going to change so within 12 weeks of surgery these patients were randomized primary endpoint was disease free survival the patients on this study had ct scans as it was a trial every 3 months we normally don't do ct scans every 3 months we do ca199 so the median age was 63 very reflective of the previous studies uh, the median tumor size was 3 cm and you see here that a lot of times i'm asked a question um, the patient has such a small tumor madam let us not give chemotherapy the patient has had excellent surgery but i agree that uh, in most of the clinical trials uh, patients with t1 n0 disease are underrepresented but they were included in all of these studies and we know the risk of recurrence is quite high for t1 n0 as well in the first 2 to 3 years so i think it is justified in offering these patients adjuvant uh, chemotherapy r1 resection in about 40 to 46% uh, patients so again uh, higher rates so we know modified fulfurinox uh, is difficult to deliver but with the use of gcsf most of the patients do tolerate uh, it well so the higher rates with fulfurinox was diarrhea neuropathy because of oxaliplatin with gemcitabine there was enzymes increase in the liver headache uh, flu like symptoms uh, and so there there was one patient who died in this arm one must remember that uh, before when we come patients do have toxicity well some morbidity and mortality associated with it just as the whipple's uh, surgery but given benefit is more towards uh, i think offering adjuvant therapy so gcsf use again 60% here i'm surprised i use it in 100% of patients uh, less in gemcitabine again toxicity we've already talked about um, so the dose intensity was maintained more so in gemcitabine than fulfurinox again it is expected this is a difficult regimen to uh, to tolerate patients have to have a good performance status for us to offer this so this is the uh, the the study which this is the these are the results if you look everything was better with modified fulfurinox versus uh, gemcitabine the median overall survival of 54 months compared to 28 months that we had earlier it's almost doubling the median disease free survival with fulfurinox is 21 months versus 13 months here and three year disease specific survival is also significantly better with these kind of hazard ratios we see hazard ratios of 0.75 0.82 0.8 in uh, that's what we've been used to but seeing hazard ratios of 
0.58.63 is very unusual in, uh, in adjuvant trials of pancreatic cancer. Hence, this study was, was practice changing. And as you can see, the curve starts separating quite early on uh, for uh, patients, those who do not uh, have an event. Uh, uh, and this is a survival and disease-free survival. So I think, uh, as I said, uh, yes, Wolfrey-Nox has more toxicity, but most of the time, the 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 side effects and the morbidity is is manageable uh, in these uh, patients. Coming on to the second study, which was presented last year, again we were surprised because, uh, like I said, from advanced cancer setting, we move on to early cancer setting, and there are two trials which have made a huge difference uh, for the care of our patients, where the median uh, overall survival has exceeded 12 months in patients with advanced pancreatic cancer. It used to be uh, six months earlier. But with Folfirinox, we know that the median overall survival is more than 12 months. So uh, that's why we, we bring the Folfirinox into early setting and we show that it works. Similar thing happened with the IMPACT trial, where we know that with gemcitabine nap paclitaxel, the overall survival was significantly better compared to gemcitabine alone. It was about 9 to 10 months with gem nap paclitaxel. Hence, the trial was done. Um, to uh, to gemnap paclitaxel versus gemcitabine. Uh, similar doses as were used in the IMPACT study. Patients received this for six months. This was the APACT study. The CA99 here is slightly stricter. In, uh, in the PRODEET study, it was less than uh, 180. I think it was less than uh, 180. I'll just check, sorry. I, uh, in the, it was 180, yes. And here it was less than uh, 100. So it was slightly stricter criteria in this study, primary endpoint very similar. Uh, so baseline characteristics, not much difference. The CA199 was almost normal in most of the patients uh, uh, before they started the uh, treatment. Um, median age was pretty similar. Safety profile was very similar to what we saw with NAP paclitaxel can cause neuropathy. Uh, that's, that's the only thing which is significant for these patients, I think. But if you see the results, the, the, this trial was negative, which was quite surprising. Uh, the curves are literally on top of uh, each other. Uh, the, the hazard ratios of 0 0.88, 0 0.82, and... Uh, the median disease-free survival of 19 and uh, 18 months was uh, was not what we were expecting. In a pre-specified group analysis, it did show a disease-free survival benefit in patients with grade 2 tumors, lymph node positive disease, normal CA99, and OS benefit in patients with PS1, uh, moderately differentiated, uh, normal baseline CA99, and lymph node positive but the study did not meet, meet its primary endpoint of meeting the disease-free survival. So like I said, it did not meet its primary endpoint. Uh, both uh, investigator initiated and interim OS were prolonged with the addition of NAP paclitaxel. But again, you know, we always try to tease the data and try and see if it, uh, it will be positive. So I think we're still waiting for the final uh, overall survival data to see whether we give up on this regimen or we, uh, we continue. So uh, we still need to investigate this because this is a very effective regimen in patients with advanced cancer. So with the APAC, uh, the MEST med uh, median overall survival was 41 months, and here it's for 54 months. Again, the difference is, as I said, APAC was more restrictive for CA199. In PRODIGE, there was stratification within CA199 and the nodal count. So I think we're coming towards the end. One thing I want to talk about is after WIPLS, it's a major surgery we, uh, we talked about. Quality of life is very important, you know, as, uh, as clinicians, whether you are in radiation, surgical or medical, very important that you look after uh, the nutrition of your patients as well and refer them on if you... Uh, this is major surgery, so very important that patients have access to a dietitian who understands what Whipple surgery is and understands, and you also understand what you need to look for if your patient is failing to thrive. By that, I mean that you know patient is continuing on adjuvant chemotherapy and is losing weight. 
uh, to, and, uh, and keeps complaining of foul smelling, bulky stool. So again, pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy, supplementation with omega-3 fatty acids, important. So yeah, I've got this slide. So uh, be mindful of this. So it is uncommon following a uh, pancreatodeutrinectomy, but, uh, but if your patients had a total pancreatectomy, then of course you should make sure your patient is on uh, pancreatic enzyme supplements. The downside is that these enzyme supplements are quite expensive. So it's important that the surgical team counsels the patient before they, the patient undergoes surgery because all of these drugs, uh, Creon, um, there are generic versions available, are quite expensive. And patients have to take these uh, lifelong. So, you know, you, the, your patient may not have had a total pancreatectomy, but still may have these symptoms because the remaining pancreas that is there is not functioning uh, as well. Adjuvant radiotherapy, I will, uh, I think there's a lot of debate about adjuvant radiotherapy, and I think we still need to wait for the results of the, uh, of the clinical trials in adjuvant setting. Currently, we do not recommend adjuvant radiotherapy, uh, mainly because of the older trials showing that there was a deleterious effect. Uh, SBRT should be recommended as part of a clinical trial or a multi-institutional registry if you're not doing a trial because the quality of evidence is low. So fulfirinox, I think if your patient has a good performance status, uh, can double the disease-free survival and also the overall survival is quite good. But to have grade three, four toxicity in almost half of your patient post Whipple's and only half of your patient do get to adjuvant treatment is quite significant. So um, because there are a lot of uh, peri and post-operative uh, morbidity involved as well. So I think very important, make sure your patient has recovered well post-surgery before you start because you have to hold the hand of your patient for six months of uh, treatment. Make sure you have a very uh, strict nutritional planning for the patient during chemotherapy. I think we should do that for, with all our patients, but for pancreas uh, cancer patients, that's even more important. And as you have seen, uh, with the, I think I, I, I should have made a table, but the median survival with gemcitabine with each trial that has gone on has actually got better. And I think that is because uh, we're selecting patients better, but also there's better treatment upon recurrence. And most of us now are moving towards the new adjuvant strategy because 100% patients will end up getting uh, chemotherapy or systemic therapy if the patients have new adjuvant treatment. And what my practice is, I try and offer modified fulfirinox to all patients, but not we know that not all our patients are fit enough to receive this. So I tend to offer gemcitabine, capecitabine as per the SPAC4 study, because it does have chloropyrimidine in it and a gemcitabine uh, as well. And, uh, and there was an overall survival uh, benefit. Uh, we still need to get better because 20% of patients are still dying in the first year. Very rarely, uh, I've done that recently in a 70-year-old gentleman, uh, I would offer uh, gemcitabine alone uh, in patients who are not well enough to tolerate the combination chemotherapy. Thank you. So um, if you have any questions, let's discuss them. Um, I, the re only reason why I don't have too many things uh, is so that we have time to interact and discuss. Um, I'm assuming you are from all the branches, medical, surgical, radiation. Um, I can, let me see if I see anyone I recognize. Uh, so any questions? Um, write it on the chat box or uh, you, can, you can unmute yourself as well. So if we have given NACT, still we give adjuvant. Um, so that's a very uh, good question. So normally we give a uh, new adjuvant chemotherapy for three months and we say that the chemotherapy is for six months. So I would give three months of adjuvant chemotherapy if a patient has had uh, new adjuvant uh, chemotherapy. So uh, the one thing I didn't discuss is uh, patients who are BRCA mutation positive are very, very responsive to uh, these DNA damaging agents like uh, cisplatin. And I talked about last time that the only patient I've had a PATH-CR was the patient who had gemcitabine cisplatin. 
So uh, I would probably give the same regimen uh, if the patient has had a good response. And hopefully we'll start talking about PRG, that is tumor regression grade in pancreatic cancer as well, when we come up with more effective uh, regimens. So yes, I would give adjuvant chemo as well for three months. Do you use growth factor for modified in all patients? Yes, I mean, all patients. I am very surprised that uh, the number of patients in the trial I think, again, uh, there are a lot of funding constraints in uh, countries where there's universal health coverage. Uh, I think it's for the safety of patients as well. Uh, I would give, I tend to give pegylated GCSF uh, 24 hours after the infusional pump has been removed uh, in all patients because this is quite a toxic uh, regimen. And in patients who are above 65, uh, but if they are very fit, I would start with 25% dose reduction and then scale it up in the second cycle if they tolerate it well. So in less fit patients, uh, do we go for gem cap or gem alone? So again, you know, it's, uh, it's a very subjective thing. Like I just said, I had uh, this 70-year-old gentleman who I did not think would be fit enough for a doublet just post whipples. So what we have done is we started with gemcitabine. And if he tolerates it well, I will add capecitabine from the second or third cycle. So my aim would be to give a doublet uh, if possible. So sometimes you, know, you may have a patient who sits in your clinic two weeks later, three weeks later, and they're not uh, as fit as you want them to be, but with time and nutrition support, they would get fitter. So I usually then add uh, capecitabine with the second or sometimes third cycle and try and complete six months of uh, adjuvant uh, chemotherapy. Do you select, how do you select between GEMCAP versus GEMNAP PACLI? So I actually am not giving GEMNAP PACLI in adjuvant setting, uh, but I know a lot of my colleagues who are giving it because I was slightly surprised with the, uh, with the uh, APACT data. And you know, like I said from colon cancer, uh, if you truly want to practice evidence-based uh, practice, uh, the study did not actually meet its primary endpoint. So I would, uh, I tend not to give GEMNAP PACLI in my practice, but I know a lot of my colleagues abroad and here uh, are giving GEMNAP PACLI taxel, uh, which is not wrong because as you saw that the pre-planned uh, analysis did show there was a benefit uh, in some patients who had a normal CA199 or node positive disease, or they had a moderately differentiated uh, adenocarcinoma. I have not been able to do that. So I either go with Fulfirinox or GEM alone or GEM, GEM cap. So what is the role of GEM cisplatin? So, you know, again, you've caught me here. The evidence is not very strong for GEM cytobine cisplatin. But if a patient has a BRCA positive disease, I, like I said, uh, some of us, uh, given the data from other cancers, we know that these patients have a fantastic response to platinum-based therapy. And you know, this is a drug which costs 100 rupees. It is not very expensive. So uh, if a patient is BRCA positive, I would uh, prefer to give gemsis platin, new adjuvant and adjuvant. And again, the patients are very rare. Uh, incidence is three to 5%. Very unlikely that you will have a randomized trial in this. Then in advanced pancreatic cancer, we have to treat, do we have to treat by NACT followed by surgery and then adjuvant chemo? Chemotherapy preferred in metastatic prostate cancer. So I didn't understand the question, Ankita. Uh, so you mean, uh, you, do you mean locally advanced? If you mean, uh, so you know, in, in early pancreas, we have uh, resectable, uh, borderline resectable and locally, uh -huh, locally advanced. So again, um, if it's a locally advanced uh, cancer, the uh, Alliance trial is, there were two trials which we discussed last time, the LAP07 study, which actually was stopped early. There was a, uh, the, it, 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 it failed to me. So there, uh, there was, I think, uh, because of futility reasons, the trial was stopped. Um, but again, you know, there are, uh, there's a lot of data with the use of SBRT, which is quite popular in pancreatic cancer now because it's more accurate. So my practice is in locally advanced, I give Fulfirinox or gem nap paclitaxel new adjuvant, because there is good data in that, followed by 
uh, we rediscussed the patient in the tumor board with a pancreatic surgeon. And if the downstaging has not been enough, which it may not be enough, then you, I would go for chemo radiotherapy. And I, we would go for cytobine uh, radiotherapy, followed by a reassessment and surgery. So yes, in locally advanced, we do. And in fact, you know, I've sent this agenda on our group on 21st, 22nd. So we have Dr. Karen Goodman, who is going to talk about neoadjuvant chemo radiotherapy, the evidence for, for that. And then we'll have uh, I, Dr. Eileen O'Reilly, uh, who's, I mean, one of the leading uh, uh, person for uh, pancreatic cancer from Sloan Kettering, talk about the new adjuvant strategies, whether you should, how do you choose between uh, chemo radiation? Because we discussed some very fantastic studies last time, two weeks ago, the SWOG S5105 and a few other studies as well. So how do you choose between chemotherapy versus chemo radiotherapy? I know we discussed a lot of it, but even I want to learn as to you know what ha what's happening around the world. So I think it'll be good if all of you can uh, join that session on 20 21st is um, biliary cancers and 22nd is pancreatic cancer. So in all patients, BRCA test is a must, yes. So if you have a patient with pancreatic cancer, now all the guidelines recommend germline BRCA testing. It's a must. And in metastatic patients, you would consider a somatic, uh, if you're doing an NGS, you would get somatic uh, BRCA results as well. So very rarely, you know, we had a patient recently where uh, the, the BRCA test, I tell this example to everyone because again, it was a learning point for me as well. So uh, I had sent the patient's germline BRCA test when they came to me originally. And I started the patient on Polfirinox, the BRCA test was negative. So we carried on and then uh, the patient recurred uh, six months later and uh, we, I sent NGS at that time. I usually do next generation sequencing at the time of first recurrence. I don't do it at diagnosis because we have enough standard of care treatments. So when we sent the NGS, uh, we sent a CT DNA because the patient declined the biopsy. We sent a liquid biopsy. So that came back as positive for BRCA2. I was very surprised because, you know, I thought, how can the somatic be positive, germline negative? It is possible, but uh, I thought, let me recheck the germline. Then I rang the company and said, do you mind rechecking that, you know, whether the patient was mainly implication for the siblings and the patient's children. The patient had three daughters. So uh, we... Uh, so they then came back to me and told me that uh, I had, the BRCA that the company had done was by NGS and we should order an MLPA, which would, uh, because NGS misses out the large deletions. So when we resend the blood sample for BRCA, the patient came back as BRCA positive. Now I would have given this patient maybe GEMSYS if I had known earlier that the patient was BRCA positive. So be very mindful, you know, if you see a result, always question it and go back and recheck it. So BRCA testing is a must in all patients. Then which chemotherapy preferred in metastatic prostate cancer? You mean pancreatic cancer. So um, metastatic pancreatic, again, you know, I have no preference between uh, fulfirinox and gemmanap paclitaxel because if it's a patient, I would give fulfirinox and at recurrence give gemmanap paclitaxel. Or if I've given gemnap packly before and at recurrence, if the patient is fit enough, given uh, uh, given uh, fulfirinox. So I recently had a patient, we get started with gemnap packly, but at recurrence, I didn't think the patient was fit of for fulfirinox. So we gave fulfiri. Then we gave Kpox. And then we gave uh, paclitaxel carboplatin. And I think we've held the hand of this patient for two years now. So... You know, yes, targeted treatment, all this is quite important, but in pancreas also now we are talking of first line, second line, third line, fourth line. In fact, I'll discuss this patient uh, next week on uh, uh, Saturday, on Friday, on 14th, 15th, uh, we, you have the New York debates, uh, the GI New York debates. Uh, so if any of you, um, I've asked them whether I can have some complimentary passes for some of my students. And uh, uh, so they are looking into this. So if they do give me some complimentary uh, registrations, I will share it within the group. So one of you or few of you can join the, uh, the New York debates because it's all on GI. 
and I find it very interesting. So I'm discussing this case as part of the molecular tumor board in that. So is BRCA positive, good PS, what to choose, Fulfirinox or Gemsys? So, you know, I would go for Gemsys uh, because um, again, uh, the, the data is coming and a lot of us are, are giving gemcitabine cisplatin in uh, patients who are BRCA positive because again, it's a DNA dam, uh, it's because of the DDR pathway. The role of BRCA in curative setting to select chemotherapy. So this is the only time, you know, we would uh, give gemsis. And the other thing is, you know, within two cycles, you will know that the patient is responding. So whether the CA199 has gone down, if the CA199 is normal, by the way, I always tend to do in pancreas CEA and AFP. Because like I said, if you have an acinar pancreas cancer, the AFP may be raised. Uh, very rare, but it's possible. And, and if you've had a long career, you will see these patients in your clinic as well. So the reason I do this is I want to find a marker that I, because it's not possible to keep doing scans every time. So you can have a marker. You may have the marker uh, going up after the first cycle, which is we call as tumor flare. But afterwards, you know, the marker should after two cycles start to go down. So, you know, if the patient is not responding, you can switch to Fulfirinox quite early on. So uh, that's the, how to choose chemo in palliative setting. Again, palliative setting is all dependent on, uh, on, uh, uh, on performance status. Good performance status, uh, I would go for modified Fulfirinox. And reserve Demnap, Paclitaxel for later. Because you know, about 50% of our patients do not get to second line chemotherapy. So what you want to do is give the most effective regimen first. And because you know, half your patients will not get second line. And again, third line is 10 to 15% patients who get on to third line therapy and probably 5%. So this patient's example I'm giving you is in that 5%. He's a young fit gentleman uh, who's gone on to you know, third line chemotherapy, which is very rare in pancreas. It's common in breast cancer, common in colon cancer but very, very rare in, uh, in pancreatic, uh, pancreatic cancer.